Hi guys, welcome to the Revive Stronger podcast. I'm your host as always, Steve Hall, and I have another exciting guest with us today, and that is Chad Dolan, who I met for the first time um, at the Shredded by Science Academy, kind of, I think it was their first conference that they did, um, and Chad presented over there, and he's presented all over the place. And you may kind of, if, if you're into the industry, um, you'll probably recognize Chad, uh, he does a lot of stuff, I think, behind the scenes that maybe doesn't get appreciated. Um, and he is a really clued up guy. And that's why we've got him on the podcast. So he has uh, exercise and science, exercise science, sorry, and health promotion BS, exercise physiology MS, and is currently studying towards his PhD, just to give an idea of some of the credentials he has, and has published strength and conditioning research as well, uh, working with Mike Zurdos, who uh, has been on the podcast, and many of you will know. Uh, he's also a competitive athlete himself and coaches people um, competitively, bodybuilders and powerlifters. And something I picked out from kind of the about him, um, I believe on it was on his website and on the Shredded by Science website that I really liked, were, that I wanted to bring up to you guys was he said, coaching qualities I identify as paramount are education, giving you the why and not just the hows, individualization, training and nutrition should be neat, unique to you and enhance your life, not consume it. Transparency, honesty, and efficiency. And I love that because I resonate it with it so strongly, and I'm sure many of the listeners do as well who are coaches. Um, I mean, each kind of element there is so vitally important. And I think we're going to be touching on many of those kind of factors in our chat today as we will be going over kind of using data in a really helpful way when using it with a bodybuilder or physique competitor during kind of cutting phases, bulking phases, during their prep and things like that, uh, which I know links kind of to the Shredded by Science chat that you did about using data, but there's more towards powerlifters. Uh, Is there anything else you want to add there, Chad? Um, I'd love to hear if there's kind of more about you kind of and what you're about. Obviously, uh, you're doing work with DeNovo as well. Yeah, so like you said, I do a I've done a lot of things in the past four years. Um, most of it is behind the scenes, you know, all the big names that people associate with like strength and physique, like I've done stuff with them, but you know, I, I see them more as like mentors and I'm, I'm becoming a peer the longer I stay in the game and the longer, you know, the more forward I get, um, progressing with my education and things. So I've worked with Mike to you know, I've trained with him. I've lifted with him. I've coached alongside him. I've presented at his conferences. Same thing with Lane. Um, same thing with Ben. Same thing with Mike Zordos. So, you know, I've, I've been around. I've been behind the scenes. And, you know, I'm, I'm just excited when I, you know, have, have talks with people like you who are more in the, in the public eye and they have more engagement with the same people that I just kind of watch from a distance. Yeah, I think it's fantastic that, there are i mean we're going to need them we're going to need people like you chad to come up um and like continue the research continue to spread fantastic information because i mean there is kind of i guess it's like there's that era of like footballers that come through who are all like really really good like Mm -hmm. manchester united had like david beckham paul skulls and uh, ryan giggs and gary neville for anyone who kind of knows football and they all were like the same age they came through at the same time and this is stuff like yeah ben escrow um, Zordo, Selene Norton, Mike Schurder, like Eric Helms and 3DMJ, they're all kind of similar age and they're kind of coming through. And once obviously they, they get on themselves, we need more kind of fresh meat as it were. And Chad, I definitely yeah. think you're someone up and coming who's going to be um, a fantastic resor- resource and uh, a super knowledgeable guy. So um, you're also doing some work with uh, Mass, which is that recent research review Um kind of helping them out as well. So that's even more behind the scenes work. And I'm, I'm sure our audience know about Mass, um, which is a fantastic research review that's kind of being done at the moment. So to kind of break the ice and um, I, I kind of, I don't know why this question came into my head, but I was kind of just interested for myself. I was like, what can I ask? That was really quite interesting to me. And I was like, oh, what kind of five key takeaways or lessons or kind of tidbits did you get from kind of studying under Mike Zerdos? Because he's an interesting guy. 
um, and incredibly yeah. intelligent. So I'm sure there's kind of some interesting things that you maybe picked up from it. And there might not even be five, but there might just be a few that you want to kind of, that was kind of obvious to you about him. Yeah, so uh, we'll start, actually I'll start with what I've taught Mike because not many nice. people, not many people know, you know, that the student can teach the teacher. So I, I taught Mike that Coke Zero is amazing. <laughs> and uh, he should drink more of it. And I've also taught him we have something called a chicken tender sub. And if you're not familiar with this delicacy, it's the eighth wonder of the world, but you take hot and fresh chicken tenders, you split open a nice baguette, you put the chicken tenders inside and whatever toppings you wish, and then you consume it, and it is absolutely amazing. <laughs> taught him that every Sunday is chicken tender sub day. You know, most people might watch football or go to church. I go to the deli, I get a chicken tender sub. Um, you know, so Mike and I have a really great relationship. And as you, as you assumed, like he undoubtedly taught me the, you know, the most important things that I've learned in the past 10 years, like in two years, I worked very closely with him during my masters and, uh, it was absolutely the best experience and the best decision I made as an adult. And, uh, funny enough, you know, I'll, I'll tell this story just to, you know, help illustrate our relationship. But when I was an undergraduate, as a senior, uh, finishing my four year degree, one of the uh, higher ups in the faculty was telling us in lecture, he's like, yeah, so we got this new guy coming on this summer. He's some Zordos or some Z named guy. And he's like this power lifter. And I'm like in summer class, you know, about to go into my last year. I'm like, huh, the Zordos, huh? I gotta, I gotta see about this guy when he gets here. <laughs> so then I just went to his office hours twice a week and I just asked him questions about powerlifting, about bodybuilding, about periodization, about training, about strength and conditioning. Cause at the time I was interning, um, as a strength and conditioning coach with our 21 teams and he was a strength and conditioning, uh, master student, you know, he coached as part of his experience. And I would talk to him about that. He was a high level powerlifter. I talked to him about that. I wanted to be, you know, a powerlifter and a natural bodybuilder. So I talked to him about training and periodization in general, and I did it so much that he thought I was one of his students. But he never taught me as an undergraduate. He just mentored me as a master's student. Amazing. Um, so eventually he just was like, hey, man, why are you looking at other schools? Like, just stay here and work in my lab for me as a graduate student. It's like, all right. And, you know, that was, you know, the, the easiest, all right, and the best decision I had made. Um, <clears throat> and I think one of the most important things he taught me when I was working with him was uh, how to ask the correct question. So... A lot of times whenever we're, we're talking, when we're browsing the internet, when we're <clears throat> engaging on forums and things, there's a lot of really interesting questions and there's a lot of very detailed questions, but they're not necessarily the correct question. Mm -hmm. You know, the correct question is not what grip do I use on my bicep curl for the peak activation of the biceps? What, you know, what, what grip, what implements, is it cable? Is it dumbbells? Is it barbells? Is it easy curl bar? Is it hammer strength? You know, those are not the correct questions. Yeah. A better question would be, you know, how much volume can I train on a given day for my biceps to elicit a growth response and to recover from? And then how soon can I train again to re-elicit that response? You know, that would be a better question. So he taught me how to think and how to ask questions and how to question you know, is this optimal? Is this not optimal? And kind of how to come to those conclusions. And, uh, you know, that, that has been invaluable to me. He also taught me kind of along the same lines, you know, big picture thing is yeah. it doesn't matter if you, so when we do research, it doesn't matter if your results are positive and negative, right? It doesn't matter if your hypothesis comes out correct or if it's false. It only matters if you do it the right way. So if you set up your research design correctly, if you conduct yourself appropriately as a scientist, you just let the science happen. The data is what the data, the data are what the data are rather. Uh, and those findings, whether they're positive and supportive or hypothesis or negative in opposition of it are important. And if done correctly, people want to know about them. So they're going to read them. Um, hopefully, you know, you'll be able to publish them and they'll, they'll be read and it'll save other people time and it'll help tell the complete story, not just part of the story. Um, so those are two of the more important things that he taught me, I think. He also taught me, again, another big picture thing is 
um, when we when we look at who we want to work with or we look we look up to role models we look up to mentors a lot of times we we kind of get focused on what they've achieved where they've done what they've done where they've come from where they've gone and uh, you know those accolades are great but I think more important is the character of that individual right that's really the heart of the matter is I don't want to align myself with the most successful person if they have poor character you know despite what doors that may open for me I want to align myself with the person with the uh, highest character mm -hmm. because I know that they're going to take care of me at the end of the day we are going to take care of each other anything that we do you know if we've done correctly that's going to far outweigh you know any sort of fame or fortune or accolades you may get by doing something incorrectly or something with someone with uh, lower character. So, you know, those are, those are the, the three most important things that Mike taught me that aren't directly related, related to powerlifting or, or anything like that, but more so life lessons. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that, um, that bigger picture <clears throat> stuff is, is invaluable kind of just stuff to bring to people's eyes. I, I think people can see it often with kind of, with diet, particularly like, what's the best diet? Should I be doing Atkins? Should I do <clears throat> paleo? Should I be doing kind of intermittent fasting? It's like, well, really the question is how many calories do you need to create a calorie deficit or something along those lines? That yeah. bigger picture thinking, you, you, as soon as you get into the industry and people who don't know any better, they automatically go for those wrong questions and it's quite frustrating. So for him to have taught you early on that you should be thinking bigger is yeah that's amazing um if do you and have another even, two things sorry well I, i'll probably come up with two more things but i was gonna say i even taught he used to always open his classes with the idea of the big picture and ask you know say more or less like we need to think what is optimal and you know i think that's an excellent message but i went a step further and instead of asking myself when i when i start consulting with a new client when i plan my own training or if I just help someone out on the side of the street, you know, that I hear talking about lifting weights, I don't think what's optimal, I think what is sustainable. Yeah. Right, because it doesn't matter, I can design the most optimal program for my training level to get me to my training goals, but if it requires me to train 21 hours a week and I can only train 12, that's not optimal. That's an unsustainable program and that's inherently bad. That's not optimal, so what is sustainable? I have 12 hours a week, I need to make the most out of them, right? So then the sustainable program becomes the optimal program. Yeah. It's the same thing with the dieting. You know, I, so you don't want to count macros. Okay, fine. We don't, we don't need to count macros. We can do a thousand other things to make your diet sustainable and then it becomes optimal. Yeah. So, um, aside, aside from those things, I guess some more, some more science related stuff that he taught me or, or more practical things that he taught me. Um, well, he taught me how to lift weights, which is, which ranks up there because it's one of my favorite thing to do. <laughs> um, you know, everyone, everyone knows how to lift weights to some degree, but he, he really taught me how to lift weights yeah. with a lot of proficiency. Um, so that, that was excellent. And, uh, one last thing, what do you, Aside from Metallica is great and <laughs> crunchy peanut butter, you're better off eating a handful of peanuts and I'll always be a baby man. Like I can't, I can't think of other things he's talking about. <laughs> those, those are some, some pretty big things. Um, some pretty good things. Those four. No, definitely. And, and I think, I mean, when you've got someone like that to be a mentor, it's fantastic. I know myself, like I like to think I have kind of several kind of smaller mentors, but I mean, for you to have actually been, under his wing for like long periods of time. I don't think you can beat that. Um, and that's amazing. And now you have the opportunity to mentor other people and help them. Mm -hmm. So like with your clients, you can pass on these skills and this knowledge and doing these podcasts, you can pass on what you've learned and the new things you're learning, which I think is fantastic. And uh, yeah, I think a lot of people will envy the, the position you were in, but it doesn't sound like you took it for granted um, in the slightest. So that's fantastic. Uh, and I think we can roll on to our main topic of discussion um, that is, I think, going to be pretty exciting and a really, really good discussion. And that is kind of data tracking for a bodybuilder or physique competitor. Um, and I think, should we start off with just kind of general nutritional things that you would get someone to track? And then that might develop into kind of 
different season uh, off season kind of competitive season sure. and then potentially that will actually develop into kind of physical components of their physique and uh, stuff like that so yeah nutritional things that you would be tracking from uh, online as a coach or even just as a in person coach so ideally you know nutritional tracking online would be someone filling out a spreadsheet that I've created for their um, carbs fat protein fiber and then calories are auto automatically calculated for us um, or just sending me their my fitness pal but not everybody's ready just to out of the gates track everything if they've gone from tracking nothing so a lot of times um, depending on if it's a general pop client or if, if, even if it's a strength or physique client you know that's not tracking as accurately as you might be tracking during prep I might start with something like a food diary a couple days a week like take a picture of everything you eat you know if you can remember so it, it probably takes a few weeks before you get a really good one, you know, because they're like, oh, I also had this, but I forgot. And then based off the food diary, you can kind of look at their habits and, you know, you can, you can get an idea based on the plate and other things for reference, like about how much of, of each major food group they're consuming. You know, a handful of grains is going to look like a handful of grains next to on a plate, you know. So I kind of get a rough estimate of their baseline behaviors. And then after we do that for a little while, um, you know, if it looks like they don't eat much protein or they eat a lot of fatty protein and they want to do a physique sport or, or whatever it is, maybe, you know, you suggest let's change your food sources and you just make one small change. You know, let's, let's go from all this red meat and steak. Let's try and have, you know, one or two days of red meat, but I want to see more poultry, more chicken, more turkey. Um, you start there and then if, you know, they progress, if, if they become comfortable with that and they progress, then you can give them a little bit more guidelines, um, more specific guidelines. You can start with the hand. It's a very easy tool to use before they get a scale or before they get measuring cups, you know, palm size serving of protein, one to two per meal, depending on their body size and their gender. Um, you know, handfuls, big handful of leafy grains, handful of um, whole grain or fruit, you know, about the size of your fist, things like that. You can do very basic, um, like dietary stuff with those um, serving sizes. And I yeah. think you can probably find them online. They're very common in the dietetics field, those uh, reference sizes. You might be able to find them online. If, if you're in the States, maybe like my plate or, or even um, like the USDA website or something might have those serving sizes, but Precision they're pretty, nutrition they're pretty close. As well. Yes, and actually uh, when I was doing my master's thesis, I was using uh, dietary recalls and the serving sizes as the gold standard in that field. And I was like, there's no way this is like as accurate as a scale. And it was probably 10 to 15% off. Like it was pretty close me going home and like, you know, weighing my plate and then guessing doing a serving size of chicken breast in my hand, you know, cutting it up and like, all right, that looks like about a palm size, putting it on the plate, checking the weight. It's like 3.15 ounces or, or three point. Yeah. One, five ounces. I'm like, oh, okay. You know, I was pretty close. Yeah. Like, doing the same thing with the grains, the nut butters. Like, I'm like, there's no way one thumb is actually like, I'm going to be able to get peanut butter correct, yeah. you know, but you, you get pretty close. Yeah. And for most people, not a prep condition, you know, that's going to be good enough. Yeah. So going from maybe food diaries to basic serving sizes and portion control stuff. And then once they get comfortable there, then it's like, all right, let's start to like weigh and measure a couple days a week. You know, and I, I won't tell them you have to do this every day for the rest of your life, but you know, maybe every other day, every two or three days, like I want you to practice using the scale. And then as I get used to that, you know, we go through how do you measure a liquid? How do you measure, you know, yogurt out of a container and stuff? And it, you know, you have to explain to them, you, you can zero out the container on the scale and then take from the container and the negative number is, you know, you kind of, you kind of coach them through the the procedures a little bit and then once they adopt it it's pretty quick yeah. and you can get it to be macros and calories but you know somewhere on that spectrum you know I'll, I'll find the starting place and then I'll go where we need to go yeah I think a lot of us take for granted especially kind of like me you and a lot of the listeners will be have done like macro counting for years and like <clears throat> doing the trick of the yeah, way zeroing it out and then kind of using how much sauce you want to use putting it back on and then it tells you kind of oh you're minus this many grams that's how much ketchup you've used on your plate stuff like that uh -huh. just is obvious to us 
um, or the fact that like when you weigh out your milk in grams, it's the same as mils, for example, or something like that. We don't really need to kind of think about it. We just know how to track. Um, whereas I think when someone comes and they see it and they're doing it for the first time, maybe like you were saying, they don't know how, they don't understand all of those things and they kind of get a bit lost, whether it like another example would be like raw versus cooked those sort of elements but assuming kind of someone's got all of those behaviors down you're saying you get them to kind of you give them i guess a range of different kind of protein fats and carbs targets to eat on certain days and you get them to track that do you track anything else for their nutrition um can you say that one more time i just or let me let me try and clarify so if okay. i'm doing this the portion control right i'll i'll calculate their macros in front of me and i'll got be like you. okay if you know, it's 150 grams of protein, for example, how many three ounce servings of chicken do I need to, to have them eat? And it's like, if it's five, right? It's like, okay, I need you to have five palm sized portions of lean protein. So I, I give them, you know, their macros. I still do their height, their weight, their sex, um, their age. I still estimate calories based off of their energy expenditure, mm -hmm. theoretically, you know, and then I just take that and I go from macros to general serving sizes and that's what we try and I try and coach them up to and then once they cover their bases there their habits are going to already fall like almost on the mark with these these numbers all yep. the macros I'm giving them and then that helps that transition um, you know it's a very easy transition for them because they're like oh I've already been doing this right yep. I only have to make small adjustments here and there um, so then can you can you clarify your question one more time so yes you've got say you've got them to this point where they are doing it via kind of food scale um, and they're weighing out kind of their their meats, their grains and all of these things to hit these <clears> numbers. <throat> kind of, are you tracking these via, are you giving people a range? Are you giving them okay. certain macros on certain days? Are you tracking anything else like fiber, water intake, anything like that? Um, it's kind of, I guess then we might move into elements that you might track differently in like cutting or bulking phases or things you might change or even contest prep, you might track certain things that you don't at other times. Yeah. So typically, um, I always use a range, even if I don't explicitly give them a range every single time, every discussion I have with my clients, you know, is get as close as you can to these numbers. Um, depending on where we are, if they're a performance based, sport competitor or a general population client, it might be, you know, as long as you're with about 20 grams of your protein and your carbs, um, individually, like we're probably okay. And then try and keep it five or 10 with your fat or even, you know, if they're pure, just weight loss or, you know, performance, I'll only set protein and then the remaining calories based on how they feel, we'll try and work out. Do you want higher fat? Do you want lower fat? Do you want yeah. higher carb? Do you want lower carb? Um, so it, Everyone is individual, but more often than not, it's try and get protein pretty spot on, try and hit your fiber minimum, um, fat and carbohydrates. You can kind of base that off of personal preference and base that off of day to day. Yeah. Um, a lot of times I have clients, even with myself, you know, your, your social calendar can affect your ability to hit your macro targets. Yeah. And sometimes 10 to 20 grams, like, isn't enough of a you know, an insurance factor, if you will. If, you know, I plan, if I'm a low fat kind of guy, high carbs, and I know I'm going to go to an event and I'm like, okay, they're probably going to have X, Y, and Z at the event. So I kind of prepare for that ahead of time. And then if it's not there, do you just not eat your last meal or just like, all right, well, I know I need some sort of protein and then, you know, I can let the rest, as long as I'm close in the calories, it's, it's basically as good as it's going to get today. It's a wash. Yeah. You know, so if I don't, if I don't provide those freedoms, a lot of times clients that are not even in prep are some of my more neurotic clients and they're, they're very, very like, no, this needs to be perfect. Like, look, it's, it's okay. Yeah. Like we can, we can take a step back. Like you've checked all of these boxes. You're 90% of the way there. Like that's not going to make a practical difference. Um, so I try and I try and track as much as needed and I try and track as accurately as required. Um, but a perfect world is two to the gram macros every single day, fiber minimum met. Um, cool. Water and hydration is another thing. I don't have clients. I don't have clients to track. I just try and one of the things I do whenever we're in the habit building stage or when we're in the, uh, you know, whenever we're first consulting is, you know, I'll ask them, you know, how much, 
How frequently do they drink water? Do they find themselves thirsty during the day? Yeah. What are they drinking during meals? Stuff like that. I try and just remind you know everyone to try and drink water with meals, try and sip on water between meals, try and sip on water after every set. Um, because it is something that we overlook a lot of the times, mm -hmm. but it's another thing to track. And if, you know, at a certain point, something's got to give. So if water tracking is the thing that breaks the camel's back, like unless we're doing a water cut for powerlifting, I'm not, I'm not worried about water. Um, caffeine is another thing that some of my clients have gotten issues with mm -hmm. is, uh, you know, a lot of things are exchanged um, via email in kind of like in a passing or a light manner. And it's like, I've been sluggish, blah, 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 five monsters this week and five bad training sessions or whatever, you know, yeah. however they might tell you. And it's like, Hey man, like we've been dieting a while. Like where's your, where's your caffeine intake at? Like, what do you, what are you drinking every day? Like, give me a rough estimate. Do you have coffee in the morning? Do you have coffee in between meals? Do you have monsters in with coffee, like after morning coffee, do you have a monster get you through to lunchtime? Then you have a monster before training and maybe something it's, you know, it's, and then, you know, if it becomes a problem, usually if context suggests we should monitor something, yeah. then I'll start tracking something outside of Perfect. the basic calories and macronutrients. Yeah. I've had very similar like times with maybe we're tracking fiber, well, fiber is always tracked. And if they're consistently under, sometimes it's an issue of, I mean, in my fitness pal, sometimes the foods don't contain the fibers, just not there. And it's like, I'm eating yeah. these like black beans every day um, and there's 15 grams of fiber and it's not including it in my, my fitness pal. I found why I'm low. So often that can do it, but I've tracked people's fruit and veg before um, when that's not going right. And I think very similar to yourself, we try and track as little things as possible to get the end result. So things like water intake, kind of sodium, like sugar and things like that we kind of like right if they shouldn't be an issue so long as you follow these overriding kind of guidelines like drinking to thirst and things like that and making sure to have these healthy habits so i think that's really good because i think it can become overwhelming when people think oh, i have to track all these things and it's right actually just track the things that matter most um, and they'll take you towards your goal and you talked a lot about kind of um client interaction which i think is really good so you're not just focusing on the numbers is it just via email that you do this or do you do um, any vlogs or Skype sessions? How do you do that sort of element so you under, get that kind of more personal interaction? Yeah. <clears throat> so I've been coaching since 2014 and I've tried various systems. Oh, cool. My, my personal favorite is emails. Um, I spend a lot of time writing emails at the university, you know, my other job. So I'm very comfortable writing an email. I take, a, take time. I write detailed emails. I write an individual response every single time. And I'm very careful not to send a work related email via phone. Okay. Um, so I, I have very good email habits and for the most part, the majority of my clients also have good email habits. Most of them are professionals in some, some way, you know, in their twenties to forties. So e email is inherently more professional than a phone. Um, so I, I've enjoyed email for the most part. It's, it's cool. usually long form. It's usually very detailed. We can usually have good conversations. And you, it, within one email, you can have four or five separate conversations. You know, if you ask them a question and it prompts them to have like a long response and yep. then you ask them another one and they get another one. So you get multiple conversations that are part of the same overarching discussion, but also separate at the same time. So I like email because it's very efficient for me and for most of my clients. Cool. The issues with that comes from people who don't necessarily like emails or don't use a personal computer. Mm -hmm. So, um, most of my consulting is email and cloud spreadsheet based. So that runs into problems when I don't have people at a PC or a Mac or a laptop. Yeah. If they're on a tablet, if they're on a smartphone, you know, some of the formatting between a, a Gmail app or a mail app, or, you know, if it's third party or if it's whatever it is, can mess up some of the communication. And you also are more inclined to send a very short message from a, from a cell phone, from a smartphone. I don't want, I don't want to type a five page email from my, from my smartphone. There's too many errors. The screen's too small. Um, so I try, I never email my clients unless it's, I'm traveling and it's just more or less a, Hey, I got this on the surface. Everything looks great. And I will get back to you when I have more time. Yeah. That's the only type, type of email I try and send from a phone. Um, you know, and most of the time I try and 
ask my clients to respect that and also try not to email me from their phones or tablets. But if someone doesn't have a laptop at home, I'm not going to tell them you need to go buy a laptop. I'm just yeah. like, okay, like just try, try your best to give me like these courtesies, professional emails, long emails, enough information. Um, I've done the, the 10 minutes, the rambly, like personal vlog type yeah. stuff on YouTube. And, uh, when I first moved to Texas, I wanted to try that because I, I like working with people. I like face to face stuff. I like being in the same room yeah. and distance coaching is great because I can effectively be in someone's pocket or on their screen around the world. Yeah. But, uh, with internet speeds in the suburb I was living in, it would take me hours to upload a yep. 20 minute video. So I was like, all right guys, like I just can't do this. Like it, I wake up, I film five or six videos and it's uploading for 12 or 13 hours. Like I can't do anything else in the house. I literally have to leave because I'm going to drain the Wi-Fi and yeah. it's not going to happen. <laughs> I know um, those feelings. So I've done those in the past and I really like those and I don't think that I ramble. I mean... I think that I'm more concise over an email and I'm actually a better okay. conversationalist over email because if I'm just trying to talk to myself and like talk to someone else, I'm going to start building and going down this rabbit hole of points that like if we're in a conversation, I'm going to see your eyes roll back or you just kind of get this blank stare and you're like, dude, you're, you're going way too deep right now. Like <laughs> you answered my question four or five sentences ago. Like let's, let's talk about the next thing. Um, so while I did, I did enjoy those. I, I haven't done them as much recently. Right now, I try and um, just do a general update, like a face-to-face -face update with my clients, and I'll send out a group email, and it's just like, hey, guys, like, just want to check in with you. This is what's going on in my life. Um, you know, not to worry. You shouldn't experience this or that or the other thing with my services, but, you know, life updates are kind of exciting, and I wanted to let you in on it. So I'll yeah. send that kind of stuff to them, and then um, the more personal stuff is email. And so a couple of my clients, another system I've used is the um, – Snapchat coaching. Oh, really? So I've not heard of this. For powerlifting clients and bodybuilding clients, I've used Snapchat because usually you're with friends um, at those types of competitions, friends or family. Yeah. And um, one of my clients, probably the most consistent powerlifter I have that competes pretty frequently, she'll always send me her lifts via Snapchat. And I know, like, meet day, I know to watch for Snapchat mm -hmm. notifications because I know this person's competing. We have a plan they have full autonomy to do, you know, A, B, or C, and they just really want to kind of like, hey, what do you think? This is what I'm thinking, and then me to say yes or no. Mm -hmm. So with Snapchat, it's a 10-second video, and then I send them back a 10-second video, and there's no delay, right? It's real-time messaging, yeah. um, and I get to see their lift, and I get to tell them, yeah, go with plan A or go with plan B. Um, and that's worked really well for me with powerlifting, and um, powerlifting, have you done a competition? I have, yeah, um, in 2015, okay. quite a while ago. But yeah, I have competed. So you only get 60 seconds to confirm your next attempt. Yeah. So Snapchat is very, very good for that because it's it takes 20 seconds. You know, um, Facebook Messenger or uh, Facebook Live, the lift and then the conversation, like that seems to take a little bit too long for me. And okay. I don't like giving clients um, text message privileges because that's a very easy boundary to overstep. Yeah. Um, and Snapchat, I barely use unless I know a client is competing. So like I might delete it in between. So yeah. they can't really abuse that. Right. Um, bodybuilding is another one. Whenever, uh, backstage, it's some sort of video messenger. Snapchat's pretty good for mandatory poses. Um, given the camera has decent quality and there's good enough lighting and, uh, you know, or posing routine over, um, like the Facebook video the day before or the day of check in backstage and you know, how's the, the peak week strategy going? Yeah. You know, are you, are you flat? Are you over, are you over what's, what's going on? And just kind of getting an idea of the conditioning with the tan, with the suit on, with the, with the lighting. Um, and that's, that's really it. So I've, I've kind of gone, gone full spectrum and I don't know of any other distance coach using the Snapchat thing, but I've told many powerlifting coaches about it. And like, it's probably mandatory right now for all of, all of my lifters. Like we try and do the Snapchat powerlifting attempts. Really interesting. Um, I think I, similarly, I've tried various things, kind of the written email format is what I started with. 
Um, and then I moved towards using the the vlogs, so the ten five to ten minute videos and feedback. Um, and that's what I've stuck with. Um, but I know I completely agree that sometimes the upload times and internet quality can kind of let you down. So I kind of kind of shift between. Sometimes some people email me some weeks. Sometimes they want to do a vlog, so we do the vlog. Um, and yeah. we found a system that works for that. Um, I do the same. And it's yeah, so I was going to say, it sounds like you use the video when it's most appropriate. So likewise, for kind of powerlifting and for like seeing their lifts and also with bodybuilding competitors, when their physique has to be kind of, it has to be what you want it to be. Um, you need that kind of looking over them and things like that. And then um, things like that. And I guess, do you ever also add in like Skype chats at all? Like when you're, maybe your competitors are getting near to their meet or to like a bodybuilder's getting close to stage, maybe they're kind of struggling a little bit and you can kind of sense that in their emails. Do you try that at all or do you stick to the email? It's it's an individual, it's like a case by case basis. Got you, yeah. Um, so I have used Skype consultations in the past and I've, I've even used phone for some. Yeah. I actually I had a strong man and during his um, competitive season to get his pro card, we would just do phone consults. He would. He would call me, he would tell me about his, his competition and I would just talk him through his programming. Cool. And then, you know, every two or three weeks I would call him up, be like, Hey man, how's it going? What's, what's up? What are your times? How's it progressing? So, um, it, it depends on the person. And I've done, I've even, you know, done Snapchat messages like that. You know, if you get one, if I know my competitor is nearing competition, they send me one through the week and it's just kind of like a, I don't want to call it a cry for help Snapchat, but it's like, you hey, hey, man, like, I don't want to do this. I feel like crap, but the work's getting done. Then if, you know, if I get something like that, whether it's email, whether it's short form message, long form message or video, then that might prompt us into having like that's that sort of conversation. But again, some people, they don't need it. Yeah. Um, so if if it's too hard for them to schedule and if it's too hard for us really for our schedules to align, then I don't worry about it. And I might film them a like pep talk video or a locker room talk video and just send it to them directly. And it's like, Hey, like I'm super excited about your, your competition. Like this is where we went from with the beginning of your prep in this training cycle. And this is where we are now. And like, I know you're able to do this. Like you should be confident in yourself because you've done it X, Y, and Z times in the gym. And, you know, I kind of just give them reassurance and, you know, a little pep talk, even if we don't get that face to face. Perfect. Yeah. This is the elements of coaching that you don't see within kind of, you've got your macro numbers, they're hitting their ranges or whatever, but you don't see the person behind it. And even if it is email, <clears throat> you can get a lot of kind of emotion through email, as long as that, like you said, there needs to be transpar transparency and honesty within the relationship. Otherwise the coaching relationship won't work. And you can even fake that over a vlog. I've had people who have left like, one to two minute messages to me over a video and I'm kind of like you, you just talked about the spreadsheet you didn't tell me anything about actually what's going on in your life and you have to develop yeah. that relationship with them um so we talked about the macros kind of and the nutritional side do you get them to track anything else in terms of kind of maybe sleep or energy levels or anything along those lines as well so that's ideal but again it's it's as much as they want to track and that nice. they can commit to tracking so one one of the other things i do that um reading through or flipping through the pn stuff precision nutrition stuff it was i made this um like mind map almost and it's like this is what I want to accomplish like smack dab in the middle and then there's like arms going out it's like what do I think I need to do to accomplish this thing. Okay. And then you have these bigger ideas. So if it's a powerlifting meet, you know, I want to do a powerlifting meet and then up top, it might be like make weight. It might be, um, increased squat max. It might be fixed deadlift form. It might be fixed that or whatever it is, you know, and then from those secondary concepts, there's a couple little lines. It's like, you know, what do you need to do? What can you commit to making this happen? And it kind of, you know, goes from all these little specifics, into the center and it's, you know, what are all these little things that you will do on a daily basis to make sure that we can achieve this big goal. Mm -hmm. So I'll have them do some things like that. And, you know, based off of what they tell me, they're willing to track what they're willing to, to, um, monitor. Like then we kind of, you know, say, all right, the sheet has room for your body weight every day. It has room for your fats, carbs, 
um, protein, your fiber every day. It has room for your sleep every day. It has room for how you're feeling energy wise, your motivation, your stress levels, any sort of comments or notes to me, and even your body temperature mm-hmm. and the hours of sleep you get. Um, so I, I have all these things and you know, they're, they can track them all year if they want, but if yeah. we start to run into problems, um, with training, usually, you know, during powerlifting preps or during bodybuilding preps or even hard training cycles, if they start to run into issues, then I'll be like, okay, I know we haven't been doing this, but you, you've mentioned having like poor training a couple times. Like, you know, let's, let's take a look at, you know, rate your sleep quality one to three, Cool. you know, one is broken or uneasy sleep. Two is kind of normal. Three is like a rock or a baby. And then, you know, let me know how many hours you're sleeping or let's, let's take a look at how many hours a night you're sleeping. And then, you know, if there's some sleep disturbances, then I'm like, okay, what's going on? Like, I know you're stressed, but you know, you're a competitive athlete or you're, you're a driven person. So you're not, that's not abnormal. Like yeah. if you're, if you're doing this kind of thing, you probably get worried about certain things and you, you, you know, you, you drive yourself insane a little bit, depending on what the, the context is. So I'm like, all right, I don't care about the meat prep. Like what, what is it? What is the meat prep stress actually doing to your other behaviors? So that's when I'll be like, how much caffeine are you consuming? Yeah. Are you eating close to bedtime? Are you like, are you doing anything abnormal out of your normal daily routine? And then usually, you know, if it's not just stress related, it might be, Oh yeah. Like I've, I've just been feeling fatigued all the time. So I'm drinking coffee all day long. And I usually have last, last cup at four or 5 PM. It's like, all right, well maybe that's not the best idea. Let's try and stop having coffee at lunch, you know, and it, it kind of, it kind of, uh, leads us down the road to finding what's, Mm -hmm. what's actually causing the problems. And to do that, sometimes I need to have them track things that they wouldn't otherwise be willing to track, Mm -hmm. um, bad training and poor sleep. I also have them look at body temperature because sometimes, um, if they know their normal body temperature, even if, even if there's some fluctuation or if it looks weird, um, you know, they might not be sick as a dog, but it might be like, Oh, I'm running a hundred. That's weird. Like I'm tired, but you're not hot enough by the hand to know you have a fever, but you yeah. might have like, you know what I mean? So again, it just depends. And I'm not saying like I can predict a fever or a sickness, but if you have bad sleep and you're tired all the time and your body temperature looks high or low, um, compared to the average, it's like, all right, let's, let's just take it easy this week. And let's, let's try and find out if, you know, we're pulling too hard or whatever it may be. Yeah. I think so. I, I track, as I say, I have so many things available for tracking yeah. built into the tables and the spreadsheets, but what we actually fill out is, is client by client basis. Yeah. I hardly ever fill out my, my tracking stuff aside from my training numbers. Like I look at my body weight every morning. I look at my app for my calories, but I don't consolidate it. And I might, you know, every once in a while go and like, just, I'm going to type everything in for the last 50 days. And like, you know what I mean? So if I can't hold myself accountable, I'm not going to ask clients to track their, you know, sleep, their body temperature, their motivation, their energy, their desire to train and like everything else every single day. If like, I can't be bothered because my life is busy as well. Yeah. No, I certainly, I can see that. And it's kind of like, I love Andy Morgan's quote of like, without data, you're blind, but it's kind of like, how much data do you really need? And both me and Pascal love data. And it sounds like you absolutely love data. So we have things like even, I don't, you didn't mention it, but I imagine step count might be something that comes in. Oh, that's right. I was going to talk to that, talk to you about that because um, we've spoken a little bit about dieting, but I actually, I use step counts. Um, some research I did recently was actually on physical activity. Oh, very cool. Uh, the amount of steps per day. And then, you know, whether it's all in one big, like 10,000 step bolus, or if it's 2,000, 2,000, okay. 2,000, 5,000. Like we're looking at steps, the amount, and also the frequency or the pattern, and how it relates to health. So I've, be, I've become more aware or more interested in step counts and Fitbits are more popular. Yeah. Uh, you know, your phone has a pedometer on it. Yeah. And from what I can tell when I was piloting and wearing the actual research grade pedometer, my Fitbit was 10 to 15% off compared to the, the one around the wrist compared to the actual research grade one around the ankle and the watch, I'm sorry, the uh, phone is maybe 20 ish mm-hmm. percent off because it's not always in your pocket. Sometimes it's, you know, on the table. So the phone was usually lower by 10 to 20%. The Fitbit was usually higher. And then the actual 
count from the, you know, the research one is in the middle. Yeah. Um, so I'd be, I'd become increasingly interested and aware of and help, help to make my clients aware of the steps they're taking per day. Cool. Um, 7,500 is considered uh, pretty active over 10,000. 7,500 is approaching active. 10,000 is active. 12,500 is very active. So as long as they're above 5,000, you're not necessarily considered uh, sedentary and that can help you, you know, I, I don't just look at the weekly average. I'm sorry, the daily average. I also look at the weekly average because yeah. I take 16 to 20,000 steps a day on the university. Yeah. If I'm on the university at nine and I stay until six or 7 PM, I'm probably going to hit somewhere between 16 and 20,000 steps a day. If I don't go in until lunchtime, I'm going to be above 10,000, maybe around, maybe around or below 15. And then on the weekends, usually around eight. Cool. So I look at my overall weekly average, yeah. you know, and I'm like, okay, I'm still active. Like I'm doing a lot of physical activity Monday through Friday, you know, maybe less on certain days if I do half days and not too much on the weekend. If I don't go train or I don't make it a point to walk around the city. Um, and that helps me pick and estimate caloric, um, maintenance and, how physical activity is actually going to affect things. And you know, that's valuable information with prep, whether it's for bodybuilding or powerlifting. Yeah, definitely. And I, I was going to say, we, it's one of those ones where we sometimes get people to track it. Sometimes we don't, again, it becomes a client by client basis. If they're in prep, like you said, or dieting, some people are kind of those neat freaks and they do loads and the diet won't impact them. Whereas other people will be like, they adapt very hard to diets and you'll see it in their step count and you can be like, right, we're going to keep you accountable, try and hit a 10K average per day. Um, so yeah, it, I mean, it's it's become another element of tracking and data that's become really, really handy. And I think like you said about the accuracy thing, would you agree that I guess as long as the Fitbits are kind of consistently inaccurate, at least that's yeah. something to base kind of your recommendations off and how you're tracking things. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, and with anything, everything we do is an estimation, more or less. Like, we can count our calories, we can weigh and measure everything, but the scale is still subject to yeah. error. Um, you know, you're still subject to error. The app is still subject to error. Like, we're we just want consistently inaccurate inaccuracies. Yeah. You know, because that's going to give us the best the best picture we can get. Um, so yeah, you're absolutely right there. And actually talking about that, some people went with their nutrition and I'd be interested to hear what your approach is with this. Um, they maybe don't count leafy greens or maybe some of them don't count any vegetables or like diet things um, and like chewing gum, stuff like that. What degree do you get people to track to? Does it vary kind of maybe if we take like a contest prep for person versus someone who's just a general pop client? During prep, everything. You know, during prep, if I was doing a bodybuilding show, I would be tracking the calories in my Diet Mountain Dew or my Coke Zero. Um, you know, it can be labeled as zero, but I'm just going to assume it's five, for example, per serving. Because if it's under five, you can put zero on the label. Um, and things like that. You know, I'm going to be over cautious whenever the uh, stakes are much higher. But if I'm not prepping, if I'm maintaining weight, if I'm just training for performance, then I'm not going to track um, chewing gum. I'm not going to track diet soda. I'm going to track vegetables and leafy greens if I'm um, weighing and measuring mm -hmm. and uh, to the gram if I'm weighing and measuring or to the serving if I'm just estimating or um, yeah. being a little bit more uh, fluid or free. And uh, I kind of take that approach with the majority of my clients. If someone is adamant, if they've never tracked leafy greens and they don't see a point to, you know, if they come to me with that type of diet experience, until we need to track it, I'm just like, all right, you know what? As long as it's one to two servings a couple of times a day, I'm just going to set your calories 50, 50 calories lower than normal. Like cool. I'll, I'll account for it. The errors elsewhere are going to account for it. It's basically going to be a wash. As long as I'm aware of that, um, and they're, they're kind of aware of that, then I don't, I don't see a point again in making someone track something that they don't want to, you know, if, if it's, you stand at the counter and you measure out five cups of salad for your lunch, or you just end up going to Wendy's and getting a burger because you can't be bothered. Like let's not track the leafy greens, mm -hmm. you no, know? Definitely. So it's, it's so yeah, with, I was going to say, because I think with those sort of elements, sometimes people just consistently don't track, um, which I think can work so long as they keep it consistent. Um, because yeah. 
like when you're dieting, no doubt you're increased like your calorie free items and you increase your vegetables over time. So I can see why you would track as much as possible when you're dieting um, because why wouldn't you? It just helps kind of alleviate any issues that could possibly crop up. Mm -hmm. Um, And we've probably got some time to talk about tracking elements of programming of training, which is probably a bit more kind of known to people, the elements of their program they should check. Uh, track even um but if you want to kind of briefly go over kind of what you're looking at mostly as a coach for your clients on a kind of week-to-week basis when they're checking in with you um so not related to training but just related to things overall is that what you're um yeah let's go with things overall and then maybe we'll delve into specifics so overall um i've actually transitioned from a mandatory weekly check-in to a, so I used to have mandatory Saturday morning check-ins before 8 a.m. my time, because I might want to wake up early and start working and, you know, be able to rejoin my family and friends by noon. But, you know, sometimes all the time, if I'm at the desk working and someone checks in late, like I just keep working. Yeah. So that can be, that can be a very dangerous cycle because I'm not protecting my time and I'm not I'm not rewarding people that do things correctly and punishing. I don't want to say punishing, but you know, like I'm still giving service to those people that are not following the rules, but it, you know, there was no checks and balances. You have to teach them how to treat you sometimes. Right. So instead of, you know, always doing that, you know, even if I get something a day late, I'd be like, "Ah, you know, they're like, I got to do it. Like they're they're my client. You know what I mean? Um, so now I've done away with that and I've done basically Monday through Friday office hours. Like there's a chance that I'll check my email two to three times per day. I'm awake at 5 a.m. I'm going to go to bed at 10 p.m. Like I'll probably see your email once um, and it will be answered within 24 hours. If I don't answer it, you know, on day one at 5 a.m. on the second day when I'm going to work for three hours before having breakfast and going into the office, like I'll probably answer your email. Um, so I've removed that weekly check-in because some clients made it, some clients missed it. And ultimately like none of us were protecting or respecting each other's times. Now they have open communication okay. um, and some have adapted to it and others are kind of like either they don't send me anything anymore because they don't want to waste my time or they, uh, I guess they just have a little bit too much freedom. So now if I haven't heard from someone at least once a week, I'll usually chase them down and I'll send them an email. Like if I wake up with an empty inbox and I'm, you know, looking through the past couple of days, I know I've talked to you, I've talked to you, I've talked to you, haven't heard from this person. And I'll look at, you know, their clouds, cloud uh, data, or I'll look at something else where I'm tracking the data. I'm like, they've actually missed a workout or two. So then I'll say, Hey, like, haven't heard from you. Notice you missed this. Like, how are you doing? You know, what's going on in life? Like, is, is, is there just no time? Are you not feeling it? Blah, blah, blah. And you know, so now I'll chase them down. Um, but I, I really like having this idea of um, every two weeks, um, requesting them to like actually send me more of a longer form check-in so I can evaluate progress based on some sort of feedback. Um, and I used to have similar to Lawrence, how he had the gravity forms. Okay. I used to have like a, a document that, you know, just save it, resave it with your name on it and your answers and just have like question prompts that would help us make sure that we got all the information we needed with our check-ins. Um, and again, some people loved it and some people used it. Other people didn't. Um, so it's, it's just trying to get, you know, everyone all over the world to work well enough with you so that you can work well with them. Mm -hmm. And then when we're talking specifics for training, are you tracking kind of volume and how you tracking volume? Mm -hmm. Um, and then anything else like reps and reserve, uh, or is it kind of, if you were talking about your typical bodybuilding client, what would they be looking, what would you be looking at on like a, when they do check in with you? Is there anything you're particularly having kind of, you're keeping an eye out for? Yeah. So it depends on the client. It depends on the spreadsheet I have them on, but in general, I will always look at, um, I treat training. It, it depends, I guess, on what type of lift. If I'm looking at a compound lift, I'm going to have a very specific prescription you know, this many sets, this many reps at this intensity or weight. So I'll know the number of lifts they've completed. I'll know the volume load that they've done it at. Um, and I have a spot for them to report their RP on their last set. Cool. But you know, that's a little bit tricky. And for some people it's a little more, um, more to do. daunting or 
daunting or inaccessible to yeah. some. So if they don't give it to me, great. I'll, I'll still talk to them and try and f- ideally figure out how high their RP is or how low it is, or if it's about what I'm expecting. Um, if it's an accessory lift, then I'll also have, you know, sets and I'll have a repetition range and then I'll have either a target RPE or I'll progress the load based on something that they told me last week. Perfect. Um, so with, you know, more or less, there's a more rigid approach to the uh, major lifts. The compound lifts are a little bit easier to progress. Um, there's some pretty common patterns with most people. Yep. You add 10 pounds to a barbell, you're going to be able to do two less reps at a pretty similar level of effort. Mm-hmm. So, you know, more or less from being in the gym, from trying a bunch of different training designs, I have an idea of how I can progress them and about yep. what their RPE range should fall in. So as long as that's matching up, um, I'll progress them as planned and I'll kind of look at, you know, the same number of lifts are consistent and the load on the bar is going up. So volume loads increasing. So I'll, I'll be monitoring all that number of lifts and volume load within the week, um, for each exercise and then within the block for each exercise. And then the accessory work, I kind of, depending on their goals, I try and match the accessory work up or depending on the, the training goal, I guess you could say of the entire cycle, you know, if we're focusing on a higher volume um, cycle for a bodybuilder, for example, or a hypertrophy cycle, I'll use, you know, more compounds and more isolations for accessory work. And there'll be, you know, two to three sets of maybe eight to 20. Yes. If it's something like a cable machine or a, a cable or a machine exercise, it might be two sets of 20 with a high RPE. So I want them to be training with relatively low intensity, but high effort. And that's going to accumulate a lot of volume. If it's a compound exercise, then, you know, maybe it's three to four sets of eight to 12 and we'll use that range and I'll try and progress them, you know, on the eight to 12 range, if they hit three sets of 12 and one set of 11, then maybe I'll add five or 10 pounds. And then, you know, maybe they fall between eight and 10 and then we go back and they get three sets of 12 or four sets of 12. And then we add five pounds again. And now they've gotten four sets of 10. So I use, um, some of those, uh, I guess more traditional or bro or old school progression schemes. Yeah. If you do two additional reps on your last two sets, go up five or 10 pounds on an accessory lift. Um, and I kind of always keep that in mind, but I'm still looking at number of lifts and the total volume. And, you know, if I keep number of lifts the same, I'm always trying to, to have total volume creep up over time. Um, and hopefully at a lower, lower level of effort as well, mm-hmm. you know, cause that would, that would suggest volume is increasing, but intensity is dropping. You know, RP is our surrogate for intensity with uh, accessory lifts. So I try and keep everything, you know, kind of similar. I don't want to be doing max back squats and then, you know, sets of 20 on leg extension. If they're doing max back squats, we're probably going to be doing moderately difficult sets of five or sets of six on, you know, a leg press or or a secondary strength type compound. Um, So I try and align them just so when they enter the gym, they're not all over the place, but sets and reps, a uh, number of lifts over the course of a week, over the course of a training cycle, um, percentage of one RM or average RPE, and then the uh, total volume load are all things that I look at. Mm-hmm. Very cool. And I think people who are listening, <clears throat> whether they're coaches or the athletes themselves, I think those are good things to definitely be looking at your own training with. Um, they're things you should be tracking over time. And it's like you said, once you found your kind of system, your progression, like even if it is that kind of that bro-ish way of doing it, which I don't, I don't think it's too bro. I think that's a good way of like progressing things. Once you have that in line, like it doesn't become such a daunting thing that you have to analyze to the nth degree every time. You just, oh, it's going in the right direction or you identify when it's not. And when we're talking about kind of someone who's in a dieting phase or even like comp prep, do you ever find kind of, do you pl- pre-plan deloads or do you find you ever have to kind of yes. throw in a deload um, more often? So I always take, so if, if I have a client, for example, usually uh, people will email me and they'll inquire about a powerlifting meet and I'll say, okay, how far out is it? If it's eight weeks, 12 weeks, 16 weeks, then I'll plan out, you know, the perfect, nice. what I think is going to be the perfect schedule. So I know we're going to do, you know, four weeks of this, then we're going to have a deload and we're going to do a rep test. Then we're going to estimate one RMs. I'm going to do an intensity block and make sure that those are actual, you know, not just this estimated one RM off of a five rep max back squat, but that we can actually squat that. And then we'll do a a competition prep block and try and push it a little bit higher. Mm -hmm. Um, So I do that with all my clients. Uh, General pop is a little bit different. It's, um, 
they're, they're larger chunks of time and it's usually, Hey, I want to lose weight and I want to see my abs and do this yeah. and do that and the other things. So it's kind of like, all right, I know for at least four to eight weeks, we're going to be doing like our basic, I'm just going to get you in the gym. I'm yeah. going to get you strong. We're going to focus on building up strength. And then we're going to focus on, um, you know, the, the pump work, the toning, um, that they're expecting, yeah. but I, I need to make sure that they're on board. You know, they've bought into laying this foundation and, you know, usually this is where conversations about, you know, the long, the long game, the big plan. If you're stronger on your back squat in four weeks, you're going to be able to have nicer looking legs in 12 because you're going to be able to train with heavier weights and get a bigger stimulus and X, Y, and Z. So I, I try and, I try and, you know, not hide what I'm doing, but I try and say, look, this is how I want to do it because this is what I believe will give you the best results. And this is the various levels of evidence that I have to suggest that. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, if, if they ask me for studies, like I'll send them studies and I'll, I'll talk to them. I try, I try and, you know, not just send them studies, but send them like a brief outline. You know, it's like, Oh, this study showed multiple sets were better than one set to failure. And it's like, okay, so this is, this is what it showed, but this is why. Yeah. And then I'll try and give them some examples and explain why so that they, they don't just see, Oh, this guy does science, but they're like, okay, like he can talk to me like I'm a normal person and try and try and help break it down. Um, and then they actually understand it. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think with everything you've talked about, it and it's very much it comes back to my statement at the beginning where you're talking about education so you're not just giving them the what the hows and you're also giving them the whys so that you can kind of teach them to fish as it were so they can do it for themselves and they can become kind of self-sufficient as much as possible which at the beginning is like it's a harder job for you it might seem but towards the end it becomes an easier job because then you can we can move to more advanced things and stuff like that and i think actually mm -hmm. our whole discussion has been kind of really encompassing your entire statement and talking about transparency, talking about individualization, education, and all of those elements whilst using all of this data um, and really kind of allowing your clients to realize what the importance of the data is and which is most important for you and picking and choosing things at the appropriate time. So no, I think it's been a brilliant discussion. I think the audience hopefully yeah. will take a, a ton away from it. It's been yeah, really interesting to hear kind of the things that you're focusing on and how you get the most out of your clients. And I just want to yeah, say a massive thank you for spending the time chatting with me. And um, yeah, thank you so much. Absolutely. I really enjoyed, you know, being able to come on and chat, enjoyed listening to the podcast and seeing you and shredded by science and everything. So if I ever make it back to the UK, yeah. we'll definitely have to lift some weights. Oh, you definitely will be making it. I'm sure Luke will be throwing another conference or something. So you've got to come to the UK or if I go to the States, because um, I love America. Um, it's like one of my, anyway, it's literally my favorite place to visit. So um, I hope everyone has enjoyed it. And I think if you have got any questions kind of that have been prompted from this discussion, um, I mean, I don't know about you, uh, Chad, sorry, um, but I'd love to kind of get you back on if there were kind of multiple questions oh, yeah, absolutely. That came from this chat. Because I think we've touched on a lot of kind of surface stuff, which is really interesting, but I think we could, there'd be some in-depth stuff that I think we'd be, be able to really get, like delve into and you'd be able to really help. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I didn't even realize, you know, basically an hour had already passed. I was, yeah. I was just like starting to warm up. I'm like, all right, like there's so many things to talk about now. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, you know, maybe some case study type discussions or, or things like that, looking at our own training histories and talking, you know, from like coach to coach level, like, you know, what would you have done in the situation? That would be really fun. And I would really enjoy that. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, guys, if you'd be interested in that, definitely comment. Um, we'll probably get it running anyway, because it sounds like both of us would like to do that anyway. And that'd be a really cool chat. And maybe even we can get Pascal on board as well. We can make it a three-way discussion. That'd be a really cool bit of a round table. Um, but yeah, I just want to say a massive thank you for coming on um, and make sure that people know where to reach you. Um, where's the best place? Where are you most active? I see you most in the mass kind of forum group, but I'm sure there's some other places that are kind of people can reach out to you. Yeah, so um, my... <laughs> Uh, we didn't discuss this. I, I actually was thinking about everything to talk about yesterday. And uh, so my Twitter handle and my Instagram handle is myodolan. And, uh, you know, if, if you ask Mike, he absolutely loves the moniker because he calls <laughs> me the fit celebrity. Um, but you can find me on Instagram and Twitter, which I'm not super active on Twitter, but hopefully there's a revival um, for myodolan. You can find me at Facebook, uh, Chad Dolan. 
I have a website for my LLC, my coaching company. It's myogenictrainingsystems.com. I'm going to work on some revamping and more or less, it's just going to be like an online, um, this is who I am type page. Um, I do have plans for a Facebook page for that website, um, that I'll be more active in, but you know, Facebook and Instagram are probably the best, best spots. And guys do go and follow Chad because like I said, like we said at the beginning, he's definitely going to be an up and coming person. And I want to encourage him to be more social and share more kind of knowledge with you all and kind of interact. Working on it. I mean, obviously you're a busy guy and you've got to prioritize, but it would be fantastic because you've got so much to share. And uh, I'm glad that we've been able to do this today. So thank you so much. And thank you guys for listening.